corona right now. There's the entire thing about this being an Asian virus and the China virus and people being targeted because of their ethnicity or race. That's verbal bullying. There can be indirect bullying where you know you exclude people from groups, create cliques inside a group. Now, this is particularly more important when we talk about adolescence also. Uh, when you are in a, when you're younger and you're a part of a school or a community, there's a lot of need to belong. So when you, so the, a lot of the times bullying, particularly as shown by women, is in terms of saying that I will exclude you from my group or getting people to side up, uh, side up in one side so that you can exclude another person, spreading rumors about people. So these are all indirect bullying. There can be social isolation where, or social alienation where you try and point out the differences, say it can be in terms of class, it can be in terms of race, it can be in terms of appearance, and there can also be intimidation bullying. And finally, all uh, one another major part of it is cyberbullying, which is a topic of interest for us today. So cyberbullying can be in terms of sending pictures, can be in terms of sending texts, and all of it. Now, before I go into any more details, I also want us to understand, so uh, what is the difference between traditional bullying and cyberbullying? And is cyberbullying as impactful or as damaging as traditional bullying where there is usually harm, physical harm to another person or physical aggression that is, uh, you know, that is shown? See, uh, in the last many years, the topic of uh, cyberbullying has gained a lot of importance. There's actually not much consensus in terms of understanding which is more harmful. But what is very important for all of us to understand is that the effects of it has been seen or the effects of cyberbullying have been shown to be as impactful as traditional bullying. Though, yes, there is probably no physical harm or physical injury that a person succumbs during a cyberbullying episode, along with the mental, uh, mental impact that comes along with any sort of bullying, there is damage or injury to the social image. There is injury to the dignity of a person. There is injury to the reputation of a person. All of these make it as bad as a tri traditional bullying or a traditional uh, victimization happens. Now, when we look at some of the differences between the traditional bullying and cyberbullying, one of the things that makes it very, very impactful in terms of cyberbullying is the fact that there is no getting away, isn't it? So unlike in traditional bullying, like say if it's a workplace harassment or if it's bullying at school or something, after the time of work or school is over, there is a safe space that you can go back to, isn't it? But in cyberbullying, that entire concept is taken away from you. Cyberbullying can happen at any time, at any place, wherever you are, and it is a nonstop continuous process. The other thing is also that the media footprint that we all leave online is absolutely not take, uh, taken away at any time, isn't it? So it can be a comment that we post on a picture today, though it, the footprint of it can stay even many years later. So you see that, you know, a lot of times that in media, you see the impact that, you know, someone, uh, you know, posts a comment, some director posts a comment today about, uh, say, misogyny or about feminism and it comes to bite them back after 20, 15, 20 years or 30 years, uh, saying that you know at that point in time you did have uh, those views. So I mean, I've just brought that up to understand how long a media footprint can stay. So though we can say that, you know, say messages or the photos that are shared can be deleted, it usually stays within this whole worldwide web, the web of the worldwide web, isn't it? So basically there is no getting away in terms of uh, cyberbullying. The other thing that makes it more dangerous is the fact that there's a large breadth of audience. Unlike a traditional bullying incident, which is probably with a small group where, say, people gang up on a victim or, say, it's at a workplace setting, an information, whether it be in the form of a video or be in the form of a photo, that passes multiple hands. It exchanges multiple hands through multiple methods. And finally, the audience for the bullying instance is actually huge and very, very large. The other thing that is very notorious in terms of cyberbullying is about the invisibility. And see, the invisibility of the World Wide Web or the internet is also something that helps or encourages people to be open, to be sharing more things online because it's a safe space for many people because it's invisible. But there is also a you know, a cones part of it, or there's also a bane towards it. 
the problem that we we can't actually see the impact when we are uh, you know when you use a harm, harmful word or you use a harsh comment the fact that you do not see the immediate reaction of the other person also somewhere reduces the empathy that a person can feel for one another it also creates fewer opportunities to for people to feel remorse for example if i use a hurtful comment against you you are taken aback isn't it or say you have a facial expression change you might cry you might just at least be taken aback that promotes some bit of empathy when those physical or those visual cues are absent like in a case of a cyber bullying it promotes some bit of uh, you know more meaner aggressive tendencies to be seen online now the other thing that is also very important when we talk about uh, cyber bullying is about bystander effect now uh, most often uh, bullying does not occur in isolation a lot of times there are people who view the bullying whether it be traditional bullying or a cyber bullying incident there are people who are usually seeing the bullying happen and most often than not there are not many people who stop it this is particularly pertinent in terms of cyber bullying because there is a diffusion of responsibility isn't it you see a mean comment on a girl's photo or on a boy's photo or a video that is being trolled uh, from one hand to the other a lot of times one you enjoy it second is also about the fact that i so said what do i do about it yeah this is going on so there's like diffusion of responsibility i am not taking responsibility saying that i will do something to stop it the bystander effect is common even in a traditional bullying instance but much more emphasized in a cyber bullying instance the other thing that is extremely extremely important particularly when i talk about it in a psychological point of view is the concept of blame and shame now a uh, accompanying any bullying incident usually it is seen that there is blame and shame that is felt by the victim but in case of cyber bullying particularly when we are talking about adolescents and young adults we live in a uh, we live in a very collectivistic culture isn't it and in a culture like ours where even now youngsters don't have permission to say uh, go online or say have social media accounts for themselves which might be good but a lot of these uh, accounts are created by kids or adolescents without no their parents knowledge a lot of times there is significant fear associated when they are being bullied or harassed by uh, in a cyber context because how who do they go back to how do they tell their parents that i have an instagram account or i have a facebook account what if my parent or my mother says that you know how huh, why did you create an account it's because you create an account online that that's why you've gotten bullied sometimes there's also this feeling of fear or shame associated about did i bring it on you know uh, is it because i wore a particular type of clothes was it because the dance i posted was a little maybe say sexier by in nature or say the so, uh, uh, so people end up feeling that did i invite this sort of uh, bullying instance so the concept of shame and blame is very much higher in a cyber bullying episode when compared to a traditional bullying instance See, uh, the reason I went into uh, this sort of difference is because you know it is important for us to understand, particularly when we look at uh, the impact of cyber bullying in terms of how it is different from traditional bullying. Now, coming to uh, the main topic of interest for most of you, that is the psychology behind bullying, or why do people bully or cyber bully? Um, I wish there was like an easy answer where I say this is because of this, and this happens, and if we are able to stop this, then we can stop cyber bullying. Uh, unfortunately we do not have an answer of that sort but what we have is an understanding about why uh, what are the behaviors that contribute to engaging in such activities now is age a factor do we think that you know it's during a particular age that uh, cyber bullying or bullying can be much heightened is it more only among adolescents absolutely not any age is no age safe so uh, through all the ages so if you feel that you know the impact on adults is any lesser just probably look at the comments that you know you see on posts that are put by, that are posted by say uh, artists or say celebrities and you see the number of mean comments and you know you sort of understand that nobody is immune no matter what the age is i'm sure even in this audience particularly the women audience i'm sure there's probably not many people who haven't received a message in their other folder in Uh, facebook so if facebook messenger has an other option where people who uh, don't know you can message you i'm sure most of you have had an experience there 
so uh, no age is actually uh, you know making it safe or you know creating or contributing to cyberbullying since i brought up gender uh, do we think that gender is a factor do we think that bullies are mo mostly males do we feel that victims are mostly women the truth is that there is no consensus about it bullying is uh, it is further complicated particularly when we talk about cyber bullying it is particularly complicated by the anonymity factor isn't it so we do not know if uh, the actual numbers are reflective of uh, i mean whether the person posting is actually a male or a female because of the anonymity factor now what we do know is about the fact that women do try so when we looking at the differences in terms of bullying or you know instances of aggression uh, women tend to engage more in relational or indirect bullying so in terms of you know they are as likely as boys in terms of being bullied but they are far less likely to engage in direct verbal aggression but it means the relationship between two people or excluding or trying to engage people in terms of bullying another person so getting into uh, groups where they can gang along in terms of bullying another person so it is not about a particular gender as well and again in terms of victimization also it is important to understand that it's not just to be it's not just that there is a higher uh, instances of women being bullied there's also equal instances of male bullying also now one of one sorry I apologize. <clears throat> Kindly give me a minute. Yes. As ma'am was yes. discussing, yes, yes. I'm so sorry for that. No, my voice just got choked. No, it's okay. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. so um, so that's about you know age and gender in terms of uh, how cyberbullying occurs <clears throat> now when we also look at the different aspects in terms of bullying one of the most important thing that we might have to remember is about dominance now when we look at um, what contributes so everybody has this need to have a social status or to have a status of power in the society that we are all in so whether it is in terms of what happens is when we need to get a sort of a sense of power in the society that we are in or in the circles that we are in they can use both aversive as well as affiliative ways to gain power so affiliative ways can be in terms of having good relationships with people can be in terms of having say performing really well at your workplace or performing really well at your school but at the same time even aggressive tendencies like say having a bullying tendency or say having a power dynamic where people listen to you is also a way of gaining power or acceptance particularly in a online <clears throat> particularly in an online field we need to understand that it's a level playing field isn't it the anonymity of the, the anonymity of the online cyber space makes it in such a way that there's a level playing field so people probably whom you wouldn't uh, you know feel free approaching when you're <clears throat> when you're seeing them face to face like say maybe a celebrity or maybe a girl or a boy that you have some feelings towards and you feel that they are not approachable in a physical face in a physical place it might be difficult for you to approach that person but in a site space what happens is the there is a minimization of status or authority that is seen so which creates some bit of an on online disinhibition effect so for example for me it might be easier for me to go and approach a person online uh say my principal to send a message to my principal online when compared to going and meeting my principal face to face so that sort of disinhibition happens particularly when you are in a cyber space medium and that creates some bit of the need to create cyber bullying also happens over there now since i talked about online disinhibition <clears throat> it's an important factor that contributes towards cyber bullying 
So many aspects of technology in itself creates this effect and that promotes cyberbullying. One, the anonymity of cyberbullying. So when, like I said earlier, when there is an anonymity, it removes many restraints that is there. So uh, when I know that probably I might be able to get away with what comments that I make, it's easier for me to engage in tendencies that are not otherwise socially acceptable. So the anonymity of the web also creates a bit of social disinhibition. And again, it's much more easier usually to create or inflict pain when you're not looking at the other person face to face, isn't it? And again, let's face it, there is minimal punishment even now, isn't it? So the anonymity in itself creates some bit online disinhibition. Now, along with this, this anonymity also comes a tendency for dissociative anonymity. So dissociative anonymity is when I'm mentally separating myself from the online activity and my real life, almost like compartmentalizing. So saying that what I'm online is not me in the real life. So, and almost like I don't have to own up to my behavior, which I'm, I'm exhibiting online when compared to offline. That also creates a tendency for cyberbullying. Again, invisibility, like I mentioned a little before, is also contributing towards, uh, is one of the factors in online disinhibition that complicates the entire scenario. The other thing is that causes some bit of disinhibition online or a tendency towards cyberbullying is the fact that the asynchronicity of it, that is, when I put a message or when I post a bullying comment online, there is a time gap between the time when I get to know, when the other person receives that particular message isn't it? So somewhere it is almost like a, what do you say, like an emotional hit and run. So you can post the comment and you can just forget about it, isn't it? So that also creates a, or promotes this concept of cyberbullying online. Now, uh, when we are understanding cyberbullying or any sort of bullying, it's important for all of us to understand that bullying does not occur in isolation. So all of these things that I talked to you about right now were some individualistic factors. But it's very important to understand that it does not occur in isolation. It's almost like a game where, you know, I understand that when you when I talk to now, it almost feels like, you know, it's like a game and online life, you can do whatever you want and the norms don't appear. But it's not exactly uh, completely like that. The most prominent understanding of cyberbullying is that there is an interactional effect or it's like an ecological model where bullying is not just a dyadic problem between the bully and the victim, but also it is a result of the interaction between the individual themselves and between the multiple elements that they interact with. So the home, the neighborhood, the school, community, the society that they are in. So it's basically an international effect that if we have to understand the reason behind the name. There are certain individualistic characters. So when I say there is an interactional effect, let's look at the different dimensions. The first being the individual characteristics themselves. A, a lot of uh, I mean, a lot of importance is actually given to the fact that there is sometimes a significant skill deficit that is seen in people who engage in bullying behavior. It can be skill deficit in terms of emotional regulation, not being able to manage their emotions. There can be heightened emotions in terms of anger, sadness, happiness, and it's all swinging most of the time. So emotional regulation difficulty. There can be a self-regulating difficulty where, you know, I do not have enough control over myself. Often communication skills deficit are also seen with people who engage in cyberbullying. There's also sometimes a lack of social problem solving skills that is seen, which is often the result of faulty learning. So these are some of the individualistic characters that can be there. See, there can also be some conduct disorder or say antisocial traits that can be seen, is, which is very commonly seen in people who uh, end up in bullying. So, and, but it's a very, uh, what do you say, it's a very dicey situation where, you know, you need to understand, is it that an aggressive youth who's probably diagnosed with something like, we call it cognitive disorder, which is like, you know, a tendency for truancy, a tendency for lying, etc. So is it uh, that a person who's having a disorder of that sort which is probably most, uh, I think all of you would probably understand if I use the words antisocial. So, uh, so if a, a youth who's diagnosed with antisocial traits might bully others because of that predisposing trait, or is it that sometimes when you engage in bullying or say engage in these behaviors which are aggressive in nature, uh, it does get rewarded sometimes, like in terms of like say, people uh, having given respect to that person. Fear also is somewhat rewarding for a lot of people. 
so we don't know it's almost like the you know egg and chicken uh, situation where you know is it what contributes to what but it is understood that a lot of people who do have bullying tendencies can have a trait of antisocial tendencies what is also very commonly seen as an individual factor is about negative self concept now both in terms of a victim when we understand the characteristic of a victim also a lot of times what is understood is seen as people who have a negative self concept about themselves like a feeling that i am a loser or that uh, everyone hates me they uh, a negative self concept of that sort tends to add to victimization behavior it is also seen in bullying that they can have a negative self concept in such a way that everyone any day going to bully me so let me do bullying first or i better ruin his or her reputation before she does mine so almost like feeling that the world around me is negative or the world around me is dangerous and let me put power over it before anybody else can so negative self concept is also very important the reason i bring up negative uh, self concept over here is a lot of the therapeutic aspects in terms of uh, cyberbullying and bullying itself is directed towards making uh, towards getting the self concept in a more proactive manner apart from the individualistic characters the other important the dynamic in terms of contributing to cyberbullying is about family dynamics now family is an important part of growing up isn't it what you learn from your family is always very important when there are faulty styles in the family that contributes towards a, a later development of bullying tendencies in children in families where there is poor parental supervision or say uh, a negative family environment like parental conflict marital discord uh, domestic violence it tends to contribute to uh, later instances of children engaging in behavior such as bullying even low parental communication so it might not be that you're actually exposed to actual violence but even poor communication style creates a sense of uh, a poor emotional regulation in children which can later contribute to bullying even when we talk about victims associate victims of bullying they also tend to belong to families in which there is a negative family environment a family environment where they don't feel safe enough to talk or communicate with their family also contributes to victimization lack of parental emotional support too much of control is also seen to be associated with bullying so there can also be certain family dynamics that can form a part of the entire dynamics when we talk about bullying peer influence is another important factor when we talk about contributing factors again the need to create a social status for themselves sometimes a gang behavior that can be exhibited in your friends can also contribute towards cyberbullying and uh, another thing that is very important is about the bystanders that we talk about over here the code of silence that is usually exhibited in uh, you know in bystanders is also contributory or is also promoting the cyberbullying instances see family can be one individual characteristics can be one peer influence can be one the other the large, large part of the contributing factor is the societal influences now when we talk about society particularly since we are talking in the adolescent realm the school interactions are very important to understand the teacher interactions and the school environment to which the child belong to is uh, as contributory towards uh, bullying instances is important the lack of engagement in school activities is also very important they often what do we see when we have a problem child in the class you tend to keep the child away isn't it you do not want the child creating difficulties in class or you know if you're trying to do an activity you don't want the child to not you know uh, disrupt the entire process you can try and keep the child aside a lot of times that's very common but such low engagement in activities is also seen to be as a contributory factor when we talk about bullying and cyberbullying the society in general or the attitudes that we hold as a society is also very important though the though things like poverty and say unsafe neighborhoods have always been associated with bullying we do understand that it's not always bullies come from uh, one particular uh, you know socio economic strata bullies are come, bullies do also exist in families where you know you're highly educated or say there's uh, no dearth of money and all of it so it's important that we understand these inter interactional effects in terms of understanding how a bully is made to remember a bully is not born but a bully is made 
in societies where you know say things like uh, you know you have uh, attitudes such as boys are boys especially when there is violence you know to say that boys are boys they will just you know behave notoriously or say that ye sab chalta hai and all of those attitudes can also be somewhere promotional in terms of creating bullies again remember all of this is an interaction effect so to understand what contributes to bullying it's important we understand the individual characteristics we understand the family characteristics we understand peer influence and the society that we are part of now before i know that i'm possibly going to wrap up in a few minutes but before that i'm going to give you a few statistics and then leave you with the impact also so uh, why am i talking about bullying in so much that or you know why am i talking so much about it uh, in india See, in an Ipsos international survey, the results of which was revealed in 2018, it was understood that one in five parents say that their kids have faced cyberbullying at some point in time of their life. What's even more scary is that out of the many countries that were studied, India has the highest rate of cyberbullying. 37 percentage of our of the population that participated in the survey said that at least 40 at least their kids have faced faced cyberbullying at least once in their life. lifetime uh it is it was followed by the united states united states showed about a quarter that is about 25 percentage of the population showed that they have experienced uh, cyberbullying which is also not less but when we look at it in terms you expect united states to be higher than india somehow but the rates are just ridiculous that way let's keep this in mind when i talk about the impact see uh, I, when i talk about the impact i'm not just going to talk about the impact on the victim i'm also going to talk about the impact on the bully i know it sounds really strange but it's what we need to understand that most often a bully is always i mean often a victim of bullying himself and the effect on a bully the slash a victim the person who is both a bully and a victim is seen to be much higher than the bully in isolation or the victim in isolation so that's why uh, it's very important that we also look at the uh, impact on bullies So when we look at bullying or the impact of the psychological impact on the bully there can be uh, problems like a feeling of disconnect from the society in itself there can be delinquency behaviors that can happen it's often seen that bullies have higher levels of frustration and difficulty in frustration tolerance they have a tendency to develop very poor interpersonal skills and also develop aggressive reactions in terms of as part of their personality What are the effects on a victim? There can be decline in academics. There can be school or college dropout. We can also develop low self-esteem. Now, as part of my doctoral research, I worked with a young adolescent population that is between the ages of 18 to 35, and I looked at the body image of body image perception among young adults and what are the factors that contribute towards the concerns about body image. one of the factors that i did study during that time was about teasing experiences i'm uh, i'm talking about people who are even 35 years of age in my interviews with them i could understand that the impact of bullying that did happen to them in childhood or in terms of the name calling that they faced as part of school was even contributing to dysfunction at this point in time at the age of 35 i remember uh, one of the interviews which i had she was a 35 year old female who talked about having difficulty singing in public just after a bullying incident that had happened when she was in her school uh, in her late schooling ages so this is the impact that it can have even on a long term basis on people so people can develop low, low uh, frustration tolerance they can develop anxiety they can become very emotionally vulnerable and have poor develop poor uh, attachment features with uh, other people so uh, an inability to form trusting relationships is also often seen in people who faced bullying or um, uh, any sort of aggression there are also effects on bystanders so the bystanders can have effects such as feeling uh, traumatized they can feel fear sometimes there can be a tendency to develop guilt which can later contribute to feelings a uh, problem such as depression or anxiety it can also uh, they can also continue to feel the pressure to be a part of a group to always feel that their word is not important and finally can also develop apathy or say uh, being emotionless in the long run 
So these are to understand the impact of uh, in, the psychological impact in terms of bullying that can happen on both adolescents as well as adults. I'm going to take a break over here. I don't want to overload all of you with too much information. This is over to you all. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, you beautifully explained the psychology behind it, which I think is the foundation of any crime. Um, so I'm very, uh, it's, it was an honor listening to you. And uh, we're glad that uh, ma'am, uh, Devruti Helda, ma'am has also joined uh, the panel now. And uh, she's an expert in cyber uh, laws, as I mentioned earlier. So I would like to uh, hand over the floor to ma'am uh, for the discussion. Um, thank you so much. Uh, am I audible? Yeah, okay, okay, okay. Thank you. So I thank Dr. Priya Sepaha and also uh, Dr. Priya for inviting me here. Now, um, as I understand, I mean, uh, it was like, you know, uh, 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 what do you call it? We were discussing about the psychology behind cyberbullying. And also, as Dr. Sepaha already, uh, you know, initiated, we are discussing about the criminal liability behind this cyberbullying, cyber stalking, and related, uh, like, you know, criminality. What happens here? Why the, uh, like, you know, entire thing actually goes against the victim and also against the perpetrator. That is what I'm going to, uh, like, you know, discuss right now. Uh, if we, like, you know, if we speak about cyber bullying, if we speak about cyber stalking, I'm going to, uh, like, you know, uh, include both of them in my discussion here because uh, I will be throwing light on cyber bullying and then I'll be throwing, uh, like, you know, shifting a little bit towards cyber stalking also. We have to see it from two perspectives. One is from the adult's perspective. The other is from the child's perspective. Now, uh, uh, it was like very well explained about the child's, you know, mentality about how the, uh, like, you know, stalker, uh, sorry, how the victim actually feels when the entire bullying incident happens. And also, as has been mentioned uh, very well now, right now, that uh, it, it actually, most of the bullies also feel that they have been bullied. So why should not they take it? I'm sorry, I'm going to call some technical glitch. Now, the thing is that we do not have um, as such, extremely sorry, we do not have as such any laws for cyberbullying. Cyber stalking law was recognized or like, you know, the entire uh, episode of cyber stalking that we can be like, women can be the victims of cyber stalking was actually recognized in 2013. It was quite at the same time that we had uh, this POXO Act, Protection of Children from Sexual Offenses Act. I'm sorry for my dog uh, also joining me here because we are all working from home. Now, the thing is that again, coming back to the discussion, thing is that when uh, an adolescent, uh, you know, he or she is in the uh, online uh, space, cyber space, the first thing that adolescent might feel is that now the space is mine. I am the owner of this particular profile. So I can do whatever I feel like. Now here comes the question as very correctly told by, uh, uh, you know, the previous uh, speaker that uh, it is the school, it is the family who should see that what should be done. Unfortunately, uh, in our entire uh, syllabus, in our entire school pedagogy, you will get to see that most of the time we do not teach students law. Now, it is from this year onwards that the NCRT has decided that certain legal subjects should be included. Now, um, I doubt whether the, the students can take it or not, but when I have, uh, you know, opportunity to see the syllabus, because even I'm a mother of a teenager who is still in the school, when I had seen this entire syllabus, I was lit literally like, you know, taken, um, taken aback to understand that, yes, students are actually being taught, uh, taught about basic rights, basic human rights, then why not about cyber rights? Now, again, coming back to the question that when the students or when the child enters into the cyberspace, because he or she owns the, owns the device, but it is not truly legal owning the device, it is the parent's device, 
he or she owns the profile again it is not his or her own profile it is the parents profile he or she feels that i can do whatever i feel like and here comes the question of where is the boundary for law speaking about cyber bullying we had section 66a of information technology act i agree with several of the researchers uh, several of uh, you know uh, judges and also uh, like lawyers that it was not properly drafted but i disagree when it was completely like you know taken uh, down or scrapped off by the supreme court what happened here is that the wordings in section 66a uh, which actually showed that any uh, like you know uh, uh, speech expression etc which is very much annoying which is very much irritating etc that can actually create some kinds of criminal liability in several of my researches i have actually shown that this particular uh, you know provision had a very good potential of becoming an anti cyber bullying law unfortunately it is because of very less reporting that the police and the judges could not understand that what this particular provision could offer and obviously the misuse of the same that it was taken down now coming to the uh, like you know adults there are different laws i mean i'm speaking from the women's perspective first there are different laws which uh, you know address indecent representation of women words gesture etc which insult the modesty of women which harm the modesty of women criminal intimidation anonymous inti in intimidation defamation etc but are they actually uh, like you know knocking at the right uh, like hitting at the right point are they talking about cyber bullying as in the introduction it itself uh, dr sipaha told that you know what is cyber bullying cyber bullying can be something some uh, like you know words etc which has got the uh, like you know effect of making the listener or making the reader feel that he or she is basically uh, like you know do not or does not possess a body shape which is according to the society it is correct which he or she does not possess an intellect which according to the peer group it is like you know right caste creed etc according to the like you know bullies that is something which is to be mocked at teased at and this actually consists of i mean this actually constitutes the entire concept of cyber bullying now coming to the laws which actually uh, like you know uh, could be used for cyber bullying as i am now going on speaking there is one more law you know if uh, if uh, all of you can actually recall it is cst atrocities act all these acts actually you know touch the uh, understanding of cyber bullying that uh, you know if somebody says something very bad about the person if somebody expresses something if somebody uh, like you know writes about something then defamation plus that law plus another law and it actually says that yes it has but as uh like you know it has been correctly pointed out what impact does it leave on the victims now whether the victim can go to the court of law whether the victim can ask for a compensation whether the victim can ask for damages etc that we are not actually understanding that we are not actually able to understand as we have we are we have been discussing that what is the effect of bullying cyber bullying can actually end in like you know violent uh, like you know taking off the lives say for example somebody can commit suicide somebody can start you know cutting uh, harming his or her uh, own body etc somebody can start becoming like you know psychologically very much withdrawn etc are we really looking into these effects no why because we do not have laws addressing cyber bullying but when we are going for defamation when we are going for criminal intimidation when, when we are going for anonymous intimidation when we are going for section 509 harming the modesty of women by word gesture etc we are getting to see that the person who has uttered these words the person who has probably expressed these words through text etc or the person who has taken to social media for expressing these kinds of bullying activity etc he or she would be jailed he or she would be liable to pay fine etc tell me one thing that this paying of fine does it actually heal your mind i belong to the uh, like you know jurisprudence school called therapeutic jurisprudence where i have done like lots of research since you know many years now on this uh, using therapeutic jurisprudence and cyber crimes i have seen that only if the judges 
the lawyers, the prosecutors, the police, and the family members of the victims, and also the peer group. They know about this therapeutic jurisprudence or therapeutic healing approach. Uh, like, you know, I'm speaking from the legal aspect. Then only probably this, you know, the, the, the feeling of pain, the feeling of uh, insult, etc., that can come down. Now, coming to the children, uh, we again, we do not have any law for cyberbullying and please uh, like, you know, uh, remember it that when we are talking about cyberbullying, we are not including cyber stalking. We are not including unauthorized access, which is hacking. We are not including pornography or obscenity or sexually explicit content that can be showed to the, uh, you know, victim. We are just speaking about speech, uh, expression, etc., which could be, um, which could be actually considered as offensive. Now here, what happens is that with cyberbullying, certain kinds of you know, behaviors, activities that can be clubbed up when the perpetrator feels that, no, I'm not satisfied, I need to show it in a bigger way. Say, for example, now I'm holding a session here. Somebody suddenly starts writing. I mean, one of the participants starts writing something which is very much like, you know, derogatory, which is very much like, you know, bullying in the way uh, targeted to me. I feel offended. But it is only a text message. And he or she feels that I have the right to do it because I have got something called my freedom of expression, freedom of speech and expression. And we have to accept the fact that this session this speech or this like you know uh, entire presentation may not be liked by many that is the reason you get to see if you are having your youtube channel etc there are so many people who are coming for bullying there are so many people who are actually trolling why because they feel that they have got right to speech and expression this is coming from the american jurisprudence especially for the speech right to speech and expression where you would get to see that their freedom of speech and expression jurisprudence is very wide so a person can keep on speaking something like, you know, open your heart out until and unless it is creating threat, until and unless it is creating some kind of like, you know, feeling where the victim would be feeling that, no, this is, this should be the end of it. In our um, best, okay, I, I will come to it. I will come to it. Uh, I just got to see this question. I will come to it. In our country, uh, our freedom of speech and expression, the jurisdiction of freedom of speech and expression is still growing. And do remember that we have got so many limitations because obviously we have got <clears throat> so many other factors which are deciding that, you know, who should not be told what. Very correctly, it is said just before uh, my session that it completely depends upon family and societal value. Now, there have been instances where I, as an adult, have been bullied. There have been instances where I have seen children have been bullied by children, by adults. And here, I must say, I mean, whether you take it in a different way, whether you take it in a proper way or not, I have been seeing that the family actually teaches the child, the family teaches the now adult that this is the way of speech and expression. There is nothing wrong in telling your mind. But in certain cases, the family and the school, the society might also say, you can write anything you feel like, but do not show certain kinds of content because you will be criminally liable then. Then what happens here is that the family or the society or the school actually fails to teach the student that these speeches are actually restricted speeches, like what we get to see in Article 19.1a and 1b, that these are something which is restricted speeches. But why? Because many times we do not understand that this goes beyond defamation. This is actually bullying. So here comes the question that we do not have laws for cyberbullying, neither do many countries have, you know, for cyberbullying. In US, we all know when we speak about cyberbullying, we all know about Megan Mayer's cyberbullying case, where Megan Mayer, she was a teenager, she was uh, bullied by another person who was the mother of another, like, you know, her classmate and who wanted to take revenge, uh, who wanted to express her anger, etc., because the two teenagers, that is Megan and the other teenager, they had a fight, so the mother came in and she started showing, you know, her uh, like right to uh, freedom of speech and expression. And in that case, we have seen that Megan took the extreme step of uh, like you know committing suicide. And after that, after that, Megan Mayer cyberbullying law came, anti-cyberbullying law came. But even here also, I have seen that in the U.S. because I do get to see cases, uh, you know, from all over the world. Even in U.S. also, 
the police, the prosecution take much time to understand that this is cyberbullying. There are lots of stakeholders. I mean, there are uh, law professors, there are NGOs who are working wow. for making people understand what is cyberbullying, but it is taking time. In our country, unfortunately, even though we are going on telling, I mean, personally, I have been going on like, you know, pushing for an anti-cyberbullying law, but it has not yet come because the stakeholders have told me that there are lots of laws which will be addressing this. Now, the question is not the addressing. Consider the child's mentality. Consider the child's like, you know, the impact of cyberbullying on the child. Now, here again comes the question of POXO Act, Protection of Children from Sexual uh, uh, Offenses Act. POXO Act also does not speak about cyberbullying. If you speak for, from the aspect of JJ Act, that is Juvenile Justice Care and Protection Act, that also does not have any explicit provision which speaks about cyberbullying. But what it says is that, that especially for POXO, if it is sexually connoted something, then definitely it will come under section uh, uh, 11 and 12, which is uh, sexual harassment. Plus, if in the course of cyberbullying, the bully feels that, no, I, as I said, I will do something more and then start showing something, then some other sections will also be added. Say, for example, section 13, 14, etc. that will also be added. And it will be the case of POXO, that is the, like, you know, uh, you, showing the child some pornographic content, which will come from section 67B of the IT Act, etc. These will come and this will support the provision or the, the case of cyberbullying. It will not be the only case of showing sexual explicit material, etc. Now, in this case, what happens is that in, in this case, what happens? Most of the times, the parents, especially, they might feel suddenly when they get exposed to what their child is going through, they will suddenly wake up and they will try to say that we will go to the police station, we will try to protect our child and etc. They're not able to understand that most of the parents, when they come in the cyberspace and they try to, <coughs> sorry, they try to protect the children, they are actually escalating the offense because here, Poxo very clearly mentions, Poxo very clearly mentions that it is uh, between a child and a child, between a child and an ad adult, between, you know, an adult or a child. But in case the parent also comes up, you know, comes in, then what happens is that the parent might start escalating the criminal liability for himself and also, or for herself and also for the child. Why? Because Poxo says whoever does it against whom? Anywhere, any, anyone. It can be a victim, it can be the perpetrator himself or herself. So for in my understanding, the best, uh, you know, practice would be when you get to see that the child is being cyber bullied, no matter what, first you have to take the thing in your hand that is block the person, take the screenshot, that means take the evidences. And if it is something which is like, you know, grave, uh, creating a threat to the privacy of the child, creating a threat to the, uh, like, you know, uh, security of the child, then go ahead and make a complaint to the police because it will be considered not like a cyberbullying, but if it is a persistent thing, now we will enter the world of cyber stalking. Cyberbullying actually happens then also the police or the JJB, like, you know, we have in the CRPC, we have the provision that the child or an adult, if he or she feels they can directly approach the magistrate also, they can definitely approach and they can say that this kind of harassment is going on. And in that case, as we do not have, unfortunately, the focus clause, depending upon the uh, nature of the text, we can definitely see that which law would be fitting the best. But here, before going to cyber stalking, here I must also say most of the people, I mean 90% of the stakeholders, they make a mistake of not including the website liability also. Whenever you are getting to see that somebody is getting cyber bullied, and I'm again not telling about, you know, uh, including of, uh, uh, what do you call, conveying some uh, uh, sexual explicit matter or violent matters, etc., violent content, etc., through the, like, you know, device or through the uh, uh, web platform, etc., it's just the text. You get to see that, you know, the platforms that we are using, be it WhatsApp, be it, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, Instagram, be it any other, uh, like, you know, social media, they give us the, uh, what you call, the power to actually block that particular, uh, you know, profile. And once you have blocked it, you have to see that this person is not coming back in an anonymous avatar.
you know it's called the privacy like sorry the immunity cloak and that this particular immunity cloak is being used by the web platforms because they are telling that we have already taken our responsibility i mean we have already exhausted our responsibility we have made the user understand that this is the way you can protect yourself and if they have not used it is not our responsibility but then what is their responsibility if the user comes up and if the user says that yes i have used all these reporting button etc and i have reported the matter to the website stating that it is actually not being taken down then the website can definitely be made liable under section 79 of the it act because they are no more immune under section 79 clause 3 of the information technology act coming to cyber stalking now because in most cases because we have a cyber stalking law and you will get to see that foxo act itself also includes the concept of cyber stalking and this is again within the broader understanding of sexual harassment so in this case what happens if suppose somebody wants to like you know somebody shares some kinds of repeated bullying uh, like you know comment or somebody shares some kinds of uh, like you know uh, sexually explicit comment with some uh, images etc which is very much disturbing etc in that case you will get to see that um, excuse me. okay in that case you will get to see that uh, cyber stalking provision especially section 11 and 12 will be applicable especially if it is a child not only that if in the course of cyber bullying yes please okay if in the course of cyber bullying the bully or the perpetrator tries to create a fake avatar or tries to create uh, like you know some kinds of uh, like uh, content which is uh, non consensual image or it is revenge porn etc in that case we have to see from the it act perspective section 67b i am talking about the children section 67b can be used again cyber stalking as uh, we understand section 354d of the uh, ipc it also very mildly touches on the cyber bullying because it says that it is repeated trying to contact and repeated this kind of like you know uh, persuading etc it actually includes that you know if somebody is going on sending some communication as hi i want to speak to you and the the the, the recipient that is the victim is now feeling annoyed the victim is now feeling threatened that now this person is not going to leave me and especially when the uh, sender is a man because cyber stalking law in our uh, indian penal code cyber stalking law says that the perpetrator is always a man and the victim is always a woman now in that case definitely the victim can like you know it is not only once but it should be multiple times the victim can definitely approach the police and say that i am being persuaded by somebody and this includes cyber bullying because if i am not responding this person is uh, like you know throwing some very harsh messages etc so that way it will be covered but not otherwise again cyber stalking also includes say for example it says monitoring of the uh, like you know internet activities uh, or the virtual activities of the victim so in that case what happens hacking can come in come in because how the person is going to monitor again not only hacking but data mining data pooling etc all these things can come in and as today morning when i was writing my the latest write up i uh, would request uh, the organizer to share it with all the participants uh what happens is that uploading a whatsapp status you know this is something which is very very common i mean it is something which we never look into it which is like when we are uh, sharing whatsapp status you will get to see somebody is constantly looking into that you know if you are changing it every hour also that person would be there to constantly have a look like you know you can get to see that that person is there and if you get to see that you know this person's presence in your that whatsapp status checking is something which is creating threat in you you are in trouble because even that presence that kind of like you know monitoring also is not comfortable for me and you because you know that you are being stalked now coming to this question that uh, like uh, i would i would directly go for something called uh, which is now like you know very trending topic and which is also which shook the entire uh, india one is that boys locker room case the other is banning of tiktok and uh, many other websites what happens here i mean do these like you know boys locker room case we all know that what had happened there that you know it was a girl who wanted to test i mean everything that the media report says and then the boy tried to share 
and his intention was to let people know that do not do it because we want to save the girl but here again comes the question that the boy and the family did not understand that even sharing that image also to the others it will be attracting criminal liability and that's the reason the boy was actually indicted and not the girl you see when the everything when came out then both of them were included that because it was coming under poxo act which says that it is either gender you know it can be a male female or it can be a third a third gender who is sharing these kinds of contents whoever it is they can be arrested i mean they can be prosecuted under poxo act coming to the uh, like you know banning of tiktok and banning of some other websites also do remember that when you have a uh, like you know social media account i mean i'm not talking about india china war or, or anything or you know virtual war or say this is so called the kind of you know i would not say cold war but it is something which is media like you know it's a, a like a on uh, online war i would not comment on anything but what happens is that i have seen that on tiktok also it is a it is a new kind of cyber bullying we got to see that uh, you know some people would be speaking something i mean it is like what we were discussing it is physical bullying but it will be aired through online bullying there would be no text etc but the man or the woman i mean especially here i would like to say the man there were so many because i was not active on tiktok but but i loved to watch the videos especially for my own understanding there were so many videos posted i mean you know those short clippings were posted for their girlfriends for their ex wives for their ex uh, you know uh, viewers etc and everything went against these persons i mean especially there was a like you know case where a, a, a man he tried to uh, what you call promote violence against women by showing that how to do a thappad mara how to throw acid etc when a girl breaks a man's heart now this is something which is not coming under the bullying or cyber stalking thing this is something which is more violent you know it, it is something which is actually showcasing that you know these kinds of violence activities can happen and this might go for 509 507 503 we we'll speak about criminal intimidation etc but these platforms they did actually carry on some kinds of bullying some kinds of cyber stalking activities so with this i would come to the last point i mean last segment of my this session what to do and uh, you know how to uh, what you call protect prevent these kinds of things i mean how to stop these kinds of things um definitely there is a necessity for law because as i saw on question here which country has got the best you know cyber bullying or cyber stalking law uh, i would not comment because as i have been doing research you know comparative research for a long time and my uh, like you know research area you can say my work area you can say because i receive cases from all over world i have not seen that even if we have laws it has been properly executed this this is the same thing which is happening in us in uk in canada in australia everywhere but uh yeah i'm i'm coming to it but the question is that you see there are some uh, laws that are made especially in canada I would like to emphasize on canada uh, there are some laws which are made in uk there are some laws which are made in our neighboring country bangladesh you know where cyber stalking has been considered as a very strong you know uh, what you call criminal activity where there would be like you know it is non bailable and it is cognizable it is non bailable in india also it is the same thing but it is non bailable when it is done for the second time cyber bullying is not recognized except in us canada or in like you know some very mild laws are there in uk australia etc but i think that we should now have you know these kinds of laws unfortunately we do not have any law on revenge porn and uh, revenge porn is almost always considered as within the uh, like arena of non consensual porn and i have my strong reservations to say that revenge porn and voyeurism are two different aspects even though there is a hairline difference so the first thing in my understanding is that we should have a focused law to focus on all these things you know all these criminal activities second thing is that you know there should be some jitni bhi services services of some kind ho gaye sorry um, i didn't get sorry ma'am i'll just request the participants to mute themselves participants yes, kindly mute yourself and you can drop in any questions you have in the chat box we'll make sure that every one of the questions will be addressed don't worry about that now coming to um, I, as i was telling that you know um so, uh, th th this particular question of like you know I, what i just came in my mind the website liability 
that should be seen i mean uh, i was actually talking about the like you know family value system the school system it should actually start from the childhood that means there should be a training from the childhood uh, like you know uh, what you call education system and now that ncert has also included it there should be okay fine it is included in ncert books it is in, now included in the cbsc guidelines also but who is going to teach there should not be you know teachers or the counselors who are uh, sorry to mention who are half baked and who may feel that whatever i am telling is correct no it is not correct first you be trained it is called the trainer of the trainer the trainees so we like you know i have been part of unicef you know this trainer of the training programs and i have seen there are so many teachers who may not have used whatsapp themselves and they are feeling very afraid that nahi nahi bachcho ko mat dena but the thing is that when they are getting to see these kinds of activities cyber bullying cyber stalking creation of non consensual porn then you know unauthorized access in the zoom classes etc they are like you know beating the bush they are not able to take it to the teacher sorry uh, police they are not able to take it, take it to the school management they are trying to hush it up within themselves but what happens is that we are living digital footprints everywhere so this is what like there should be properly trained trainers properly trained teachers now coming to the question of uh what you call making the child aware of the criminal liability this is also like now that law subjects are being included i think that from the very childhood the family that is especially the parents they should attend this parent teacher meeting and uh, apart from like how much my child has got in my uh, in the exam and how much your child has got in the exam and why my child is you know doing not doing good in maths i think there should be sessions on this parent uh, teacher meeting also whereby the schools and the like you know trainers they should tell the parents that you know these are the criminal liabilities these are the like you know uh, uh, what you call puny criminal liabilities etc that should be taught to the children that should be taught to the parents also i know many schools are holding sessions but this should be increased the, the volume of this kind of things should be increased thing next thing is that reporting most of the parents and also like you know adults also we do not feel like reporting the matter i recently had a case where a child was like you know a 16 year old child she was told many sexually explicit things over phone by her own uh, aunt because uh, the parents were not having proper like you know with the uh, there was some family dispute and the mother was uh, with the child and it was like you know the child was traumatized so in that case and this uh, the the lady uh, the 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 perpetrator the child said that the perpetrator herself is probably connected with some schools now we do not have, want to have these kinds of teachers right so in that case it should be like you know the teachers should also be sensitized to what to say what not to say because we know when the child is entering into senior secondary school that means in the 11th and 12th the child may be out of the like you know curiosity out of the adolescent nature etc the child will be knowing many things that even you and me we did not know when we were of her age so in that case reporting must be done the child was not willing to report the mother was also not willing to report because they were all fearing something that you know something will happen but no this should not be done so proper reporting mechanism should be used and reporting should be done because all of us should know that if it is a matter of child if it is a matter of woman the crpc that is criminal procedure law and also you will get to see the jj act poxo act etc they give confidentiality they give like you know the the sense of privacy to the uh, reporters that is the victims then finally i would also like to say that okay fine we do not want to make the website you know pull pull in the websites but do consider it act information technology act we do have extra territorial jurisdiction we may not have the treaties as such which will be like you know bringing back the fugitives who are uh, like you know fugitives or i would rather say the offenders who are sitting outside the jurisdiction they are doing all these things but the websites you know you cannot have a business in our country if you are not helping us out so it is best that if we are making a report all victims must remember that with the uh, like you know making a report of the perpetrator we should also mention which platform they had been victimized how the platform or the web platform did not cooperate with them and how and where this section 79 has been violated so i think if all these things are uh, you know uh, kept in mind and followed i think the problems of uh, like you know uh, cyber stalking or the problems of cyber bullying or any sort of online harassment may be uh, like you know controlled with this i end my session thank you so much for inviting me i think uh, i could uh, you know make many people aware of what probably they were not aware of thank you so much sure ma'am ma'am thank you so much uh, it was a very insightful session and uh, i'm a law student myself 
and the amount of research you've put into this discussion. Um, uh, it's really nice to be aware mm -hmm. of some uh, of the problem which I think every person has faced as Atholia ma'am already mentioned. We all have in some way or the other faced uh, cyber stalking or bullying, the levels vary though, but uh, it's good to be aware about such laws and, adult, and the need of uh, stringent laws too. Now moving on to the questions uh, our participants have asked, we've received a questions uh, we received a question saying, how do we avoid cyberbullying? And uh, ma'am, the uh, question is open to both of you. I'm leaving it up to you. Should I take it or should I, uh, should uh, Dr. Atulia, um, should both take Both of it? you can, uh, both of you can just, uh, you know, answer it. I had our two friends. <laughs> Okay. Let me, first, open, yeah, let, me first, uh, let me first address it from the legal side, then uh, psychology <laughs> should come sure. in, right? Sure. Yeah, okay. sure, yeah. So the first thing, because legal side is more important than the psychological, I mean, both are important, but still then. Cyberbullying can be stopped only once, uh, only when the, you know, uh, the, the victim actually, uh, sorry, the, I'll start with the perpetrator. The perpetrator understands that what sort of criminal liability he or she is attracting. And uh, the second thing is that, as I, as I mentioned about the freedom of speech and expression, you see, this is the, if you're talking about the child being cyber bullied, or if you're talking about an adolescent, uh, like, you know, individual who is being cyber bullied most of the time, as Dr. Atulia will uh, agree with me, they will not share it with their parents, right? So they will try to do something with themselves. This should be stopped. You know, this is what I call as irrational coping me like mechanism, especially from the legal side, because once, as Dr. Atulia correctly said, that, you know, the bullied victim may, might turn into a bully. When, when the uh, victim or, or anybody, you know, for the first time when he or she is receiving any bullying comment, you see, this is the, the, the time that he or she must immediately share it with the parents, that this is what I'm going through. And the parents also should not take any sort of, like, you know, irrational coping mechanism of, like, what Megan, Megan Mayer's, uh, like, you know, bully's mother did. She, she was in jail because of what she did. And that should be considered as the biggest example because if you take this bullying thing or the law in your hand, you will be where the other perpetrators are. There is no excuse that you are the victim's mother or you are the perpetrator's mother or your child is a young uh, like you know, individual. There is no excuse. So in that case, I believe that cyberbullying may be stopped when the entire, like if you see the family as a unit, entire family unit comes up to support the child and there is a clear communication with the child that okay you are using this device you are using the internet but we are there with you to support you this is what the thing should be done perpetrator also it is like you know again uh, i think dr Atulia will uh, support me or agree with me it is all here you know you have to control your anger you have to control your emotions when you are on online I'll, I'll say something like, you know, even though I don't know whether you will take it in uh, correct way or not. There was like, you know, when I was going through the international news, there was a meeting going, going on in England. And uh, like, you know, this was uh, for the counselors. And it is not the school counselors or something. It is the government counselors. So one of the participants, and it came out in the news uh, report also. One of the participants, he was, he suddenly thought that his camera is off. He went inside the shower and he started taking the shower. And everybody saw, it was a Zoom meeting, everybody saw that this person is taking shower. Fortunately, there was no child. Otherwise, he would have been booked for, you know, creating some sexually explicit uh, content. Again, there was one more incident yesterday, it was reported. BSNL had sacked an employee. And uh, uh, the lady, actually, what she did is that it's a very private thing. She had two children and she offered the two children to paint on her body. This is something which we all mothers, I mean, we when we take rest, we tell our uh, children, do whatever you feel like, don't disturb me. But the thing is that she made this particular uh, entire activity as online open for public. And she was also booked for a POXO Act, which means that whether you are the mother of the child, whether you are the father of the child, you are not excused. So this is the thing that, you know, the parents, the child and the entire like peer group, we must be uh, like, you know, aware that where is our limitation for the adults also because we have the laws we must remember that what to say what not to say so that is where like you know again i'm telling it is control over our rights to freedom of speech and expression only once we know about this and how to block that person who is disturbing us i think cyberbullying may be uh, controlled 
I'm just going to add a few more uh, things. I absolutely support what you're saying, Dr. Ribasi. Uh, see, I'm going to add to what you said in terms of knowledge is definitely part. See, in terms of addressing uh, how to avoid cyberbullying or how to reduce the instances of cyberbullying, I think it's very important for us to also go to the roots of why and how it's going on. See, in terms of knowledge is power, let's also say, as you know, I, I know a few of you over here are planning to have children yourself. Uh, you know, one thing I would always uh, advocate as pa for parents is in terms of taking an active, uh, you know, active initiative in terms of understanding or knowing about cyber, uh, cyberspace yourself. You know, your, your children themselves can be really good teachers. Sit along with them, try and, uh, you know, learn to, uh, you know, treat your children as experts, encourage them to teach you about the cyberspace. So then the, that itself will promote some bit of active communication with one another. You know, it helps them uh, understand that, you know, they can come and talk to you if required. And more than that, it helps you identify when and how these instances can happen and thereby avoid it. See, it's a very alarming statistic that only 35% of children actually go to their parents when they have had an incident. Mm -hmm which is really very really dangerous. Like Dr. Devruti was saying, if we can help to manage more active communication in the family, nothing like it. The other that we will have to work on is going to be in terms of teachers and uh, say in terms of people with whom they spend a lot of time. So even before such instances can happen, if we can help identify these children who do have tendencies towards more aggressive aggression or children who are probably a misfit in their class, so help them with uh, skills such as empathy, to help them with skills such as uh, emotional regulations, managing problem solving, that would be a very, very important thing. And somewhere also working in terms of enhancing self-esteem and how there can be like a praising behavior for even all children. So like I said, you know, it's very important to understand that sometimes bullies themselves have been victims before. So uh, it's very easy to just, you know, push them aside saying they are, you know, bad eggs in the basket and, you know, keep them aside. But that doesn't solve anything, isn't it? If we just punish, end up punishing these children, it doesn't solve anything. What we will have to do is to actively take an effort to correct these children in terms of the skill deficit that, that they can have. And once we identify such children, it's very important that we try and I, you know, maybe refer them for therapy. So I, uh, I am a part of an organization that's called Therapeut. We, uh, as part of uh, the work that we do at Therapeut, we also do online sessions or online, not just children, but adults, but everybody, to try and work, particularly in terms of people who've had trauma experiences, such as bullying, we try and work with children in terms of uh, helping their self-esteem build, to get better cognitive understanding of what is going on with them, to also help them develop more pro-social behaviors. And a lot of time, assert these anger, uh, anger issues come out of a difficulty in terms of asserting themselves properly. So assertiveness training is also a very important part of helping these children such that we can avoid cyberbullying instances. I think that should probably be a way to go forward. That's, that's a great suggestion, ma'am. Um, so the next question we have from our participant is, um, is it possible to cover cyberspace crime during the times of COVID-19, especially with the focus on corporate sector working women? as the work from home is the new normal out of necessity of course what kind of cyberspace harassment they might undergo let me answer let sure. me answer first because i have been watching these things so much the first thing is that uh, over your zoom meeting if you are a working woman you might have seen uh, privacy infringement and uh, workplace bullying is there workplace cyber bullying is there trolling is there and then your data, uh, like, you know, data stealing can be there. And uh, unnecessarily, there would be harassment on social media platforms. Now, uh, the law very clearly says about, and especially, like, uh, we do have law on protection of, uh, like, you know, uh, sexual harassment of women protection uh, at, the, at the Workplace Act, now, which is popularly known as Posh Act. Now, uh, when we were in the physical space, when it was not a new normal, it was normal, very normal, you would get to see that there, uh, like, you know, this stalking uh, was considered as one of the offenses within the Porsche Act, that is uh, sexual harassment of women at workplace. And uh, it was also like if anybody used to show anything, like, you know, anybody would take the so-called uh, quote-unquote liberty of showing any porn content, sexual explicit content, etc., Porsche Act would be there for 
helping the woman victim and uh, it also mentioned that these are also to be clubbed up with ipc or the it act now that it is new normal the question which comes in our mind is that can the uh, like you know the scope of posh act that is uh, workplace uh, sexual harassment at workplace be pulled for the virtual workplace my answer is yes because when you are on duty you have to see it from the labor law perspective also when you are on duty you are on duty and during this duty hour if somebody comes up to harass you if somebody comes up to message you something which is not uh, appropriate etc when somebody comes up for you know unauthorized access etc or somebody shares something when you are in a meeting or when you are working on something definitely posh act can be uh, like you know uh, applicable and it has got uh, it has extended its scope for cyberspace also now consider again when uh, like you know one uh, uh, when a person is not on duty say for example we are free from i mean we are engaged from 9 to 5 after 5 when we are doing some homework for the next day's work if somebody comes up and some somebody sends some you know uh, sexual explicit uh, material or anything else like you know online harassment then definitely it will be under ipc it will be under it act also because since we are working from home it is a conglomeration of several laws which will be applicable and it you have to show actually uh, like for whom and for uh, like you know on which you are actually working um this this is my answer obviously here it act provisions will be used i mean depending upon the nature of the harassment and also ipc uh, provisions will be used and my answer to the entire question is yes workplace uh, like you know during this new normal uh, like you know trend if somebody if a woman is harassed then yes there are criminal liabilities that should be attached with that and the workplace that means the office space or the office uh, what should i say the the, the management they also are liable that what kind of platform they are actually offering and whether it is a safe platform for women or not that also it is their responsibility but again it is a shared responsibility i would rather say where they would say that you should have taken your uh, like you know security measures and we definitely as victims we can say that the platform you had offered it did not have proper security that's it yes ma'am and um i would request atulia uh, ma'am to also uh, throw sh- some light on how does um, working from home and then on the top of it being harassed or, or bullied online in workplaces take a toll on a person's mental health uh, how does a person cope up with it are there any trends that uh, have been emerging in these times yes absolutely see uh, one of the things that i'm very uh, grateful about the new normal of having uh, see uh, online uh, you know have more webinars online or so more reach out the terms of online is also the fact that there's also been a lot more communication about mental health so uh, what we're talking about in terms of particularly in terms of uh, covid times or in terms of the quarantine and all of it like dr devrati was saying there is a lot of intrusion there's a lot of personal intrusion that uh, occurs so even like you know, just to give you a basic example so i am in a space over here and i am we are also at a place where we give out a lot of personal information knowingly or unknowingly isn't it so right now my screen is on you can see a map behind me you can easily identify i am an indian you can see certain books behind me so there's a lot of information that uh, i sort of put out uh, knowingly or unknowingly when i'm being part of the uh, part of a zoom meeting or whatever so those need a lot i mean those can be misused to a large extent where you know there were instances i was just reading about recently about uh, how a person was uh, bullied about his choice in term, in about a particular uh, sports uh, group so they belong to two different ideologies in terms of sports and that per- person was constantly bullied about it and how they understood about that person's interest in sport was about what was seen behind in terms of the poster that was there in the room so uh, things of that sort become extremely important where you know there is a lot of conversation that happens the other thing is uh, i'm just not going to talk about the, uh, the adults who are there in the work from home space what it also contributes is lack of supervision for the young children who are at home right now particularly in terms of when there are online classes and all of it that is happening at this point in time uh, supervision in terms of uh, when children have more uh, access to internet and have more access to online content so provision is not exactly done in a very uh, in a very meticulous manner unfortunately because parents are also burdened themselves isn't it they have too many things to take care of the house chores the difficulties with uh, balancing work at home so all of it also creates a huge uh, routine a huge strain on themselves 
and then when there is cyber bullying that is added to it the entire fear of me not being a good enough uh, you know mother possibly because i'm not able to monitor my child or say when there is instances reported all of it just add to the cognitive burden that a person actually uh, you know is going through this is also very very important ma'am before addressing the other questions in our chat box uh, a similar question to mental health i really admire that uh, devrati ma'am addressed the current uh, case uh, the recent case of boys locker room uh, what are your opinions your insights on this irrespective of who the victim was who planned it was there some miscommunication because a lot of facts are unclear but what is what uh, can you just throw some light on how it uh, affects the minds of young girls and boys who are simply putting up pictures like any other person in their class on social media uh, and because i have seen that uh, you work on body image and uh, you know areas like that how does it take a toll on their mental health okay thank you so much priya for that question see um, uh, what i have to tell you over here at this point in time is when an incident of this sort happens which is you know uh, there in public knowledge it's not just the people who are part of that particular incident who gets affected uh, for almost about 2 weeks after not even just 2 weeks so even after that a lot of my adolescent clients every conversation we had to start or uh, start with the boys locker room it brought up so much emotional turmoil in them though they were not exactly part of the group or they did not go through the incident themselves it felt very personal it was very personal it was very scary to them and uh, i i mean there were lots of times when we had to stop the goals that we had in therapy sessions to actually address what teasing is it brought up a lot of memories in terms of past experiences for themselves a lot of experiences which probably they keep a side set aside that saying okay this was just a joke a person just had fun with me a lot of times that's what happens in cyber bullying also isn't it you don't uh, you're not able to differentiate between a harmless joke or a bullying incident so what also did occur during that time period was when a lot of children did come up with instances of instances of when they were bullied uh, as a child it can be in terms of appearance it can be in terms of the things that they do so say things like you know like priya you were saying it's just a picture like i posted like a friend of mine posted but why am i getting those comments so it brings about a lot of shame in people and a lot of guilt sometimes so uh, again sometimes it's about the fact that did i do something was it that the dance that i did was probably a little provocative by nature or was it that you know i posted it in the wrong medium so often people are not able to understand and this is true not just for children who are probably say slightly introverted in nature because that's the cyberspace is probably a place where they express themselves it is also true for people who are very popular in their gangs so even uh, when they even the big tiktok stars and all of it they get targeted it was a huge uh, for some people it was a huge re revelation or a full uh, a huge uh, thankfulness feeling that it is not it's not just me who's going through such experiences there are other people who go through such experiences but for a lot many other people it was bringing up traumatic memories of what happened not just uh, in terms of appearance and all of it the other thing i would uh, bring up is like about academic shaming so academic shaming that is seen often in schools uh, was also brought up quite a bit after the boys locker room incident so uh, i think it uh, plays a lot with the mind of the child in terms of bringing previous trauma and also in terms of also like it promotes some bit of action that is probably a good part of the boys locker room incident where it did create some action where people were ready to move away from that bystander role and to actually go into the action mode of doing something about it thank you so much ma'am so um a sub question to it i would like to ask devrati ma'am uh, since we are major a lot of law students have joined in uh, there is a constant debate uh, when we are talking about cyber security uh, laws that uh, they also uh, sometimes contradict the developments in data protection laws as well as the right to privacy and this was highlighted in the boys locker room a lot that chats were um, released and they were posted on so many social media accounts and otherwise also whenever a bully is pointed out uh their chats are the main evidences and the defense always comes up as the right to privacy so what are your thoughts on that how does uh how do we come up with a mechanism which does justice to all these rights as uh but at the same time protects the basic rights of these kids who are facing bullying online okay uh 
my device is tilting a little bit and it is actually infringing my privacy so apart from that see the thing is that if you read a uh, criminal procedure code and if you read evidence law very clearly you don't act actually have to go for data protection you know uh, gdpr or the data protection bill etc or even it act also what it very clearly says is that if suppose for example a victim has been victimized by any sort of content or any sort of object etc that becomes uh, an evidence right and that itself should be considered as a very confidential evidence now it is unfortunate fact that you know that particular statement that particular photograph etc that has been shared that had been shared and that are going to be shared in future also uh, the thing is that here you cannot actually question the like you know the uh, uh, what you call the privacy advocates or the like defense counsel's advocates or the prosecution because it is not in their hand see in the, some of my researches and my ongoing researches also i have indicated if you see electronic governance i know there are some law students who are now interested in cyber law also if you see electronic governance you will get to see there is something called auditing of the uh, like you know website auditing of the cyber infrastructure you see this actually says that auditing what what actually auditing means this means that you are you know verifying you are actually uh, what you call up up uh, grading the entire system whether it is okay or not what happens you are bringing a particular evidence and you are submitting it in the court but it is actually like you know it's a, it's a fraction of the evidence which is coming the entire uh, content is sitting in some other device for example i would uh, rather give you i mean i'm not going for boys locker room case i am going for the very uh, like you know sensitive case of this delhi metro case where uh, you know two young uh, like adults or maybe they are full adults they were captured as you know in a very uh, what you call a compromising position who were sitting there and they were sitting in a very much dark place now cctv camera captured it and it had gone for the uh, like you know youtube also it, it has gone for the uh, sexual uh, consumption of that particular content also who was managing that particular uh, you know data capturing who was managing the images that were being generated by the cctv camera it was some third party how did it go in the public see this when the police was investigating fine they have actually considered these two like you know couple as creating something which is obscene which is sexually explicit in the public place if you consider this as a public place but the thing is that they probably had the privacy because they felt that they are sitting in a place where it is a private place in a public place now this here comes the question of which particular platform or which particular like you know main uh, agency was in the uh, what you call control of that particular device or that particular platform or that particular uh, what should i say infrastructure which should have saved the particular evidence or which should have saved that particular image or that particular uh, what should i say text etc how did it go out that is the reason most of the law students would, would agree with me and if uh, there are practitioners and law teachers are also there respectfully all of them would agree with me that when you see that uh, a, a, a court case you know uh, when the supreme court or the high court is deciding on a case it is written very like you know minute i mean small small letters that it is actually reportable to the public now here comes the question of what should be reportable to the public what should not be reportable to the public i again bring this understanding of right to be forgotten now what is right to be forgotten and whether it is actually uh, like you know applied in the indian understanding or not uh, some years back when i was in uh, i think uh, manipur judicial academy i met one of the very renowned delhi high court judge and uh, we were discussing over a cup of coffee that uh, whether right to be forgotten is now being used for this uh, you know cases of domestic uh, dispute and all these things so he said yes but we still have problems in you know implicating it now the same thing once the defendant or the victim comes to know that when the case is like you know going on and the entire thing has come up it is on the media it is on the persons who have made it public they are the responsible persons why did you do it most of the time if you see from the poxo act perspective it is very clearly stated that if there is um, i'm coming to it if there is something which is involving the child and it is a sexual uh, harassment or it is uh, like you know penetrative sexual assault or it is a uh, you know anything which is web content involving child in a sexual uh, uh, offensive thing if somebody has shared it 
then the person who has shared it would be responsible. And the person, he, it, it very clearly mentions, and the person who sees that, you know, and they have not reported, they're also liable because it is, again, leaving a digital footprint. Now, consider this thing, uh, again, uh, some days back, I got to see, like, you know, there was uh, one, uh, one friend of mine who was sharing, like, you know, that this particular uh, image was, or audio video clip, uh, it was probably two to three years uh, old. So she was given a particular, uh, you know, content which showed that there was a nude, uh, like, you know, uh, uh, girl who was being beaten, etc. And she told me that, can you please help? And when I immediately took it to the police, the police definitely asked me from where did you get it? I had to show and I said that we are all trying to help because we are trying to stop circulation of this thing, you know, over the web world. And the police, uh, like, you know, officer also told that, Madam, we do understand because this is a two years old clipping, which is now being circulated everywhere. Where, what do we do? It is we, the responsible netizens, who should be taking a step that we should block it. Unfortunately, in the, uh, like, you know, WhatsApp, because this came through WhatsApp, in the WhatsApp, you will get to see that you can block the uh, particular person, but you might not be able to block the content. It will be, you know, from one device to another device, from one number to another number, as we popularly call, from one profile to another profile, it will be traveling. And that's how it might go and sit in somebody else's device who would again take it to some other, uh, like, you know, social media profile, uh, like supporting the matter that I was ignorant. I did not know. Now, this should, should be avoided. And again, uh, here, I have to bring the data protection uh, understanding. I have to bring the like you know uh, legal understanding of Evidence Act uh, and also if it is for the child the POXO Act, whereby it is very clearly stated that you cannot once it is being used by the courts or once it has been submitted as an evidence, you cannot share it anywhere until and unless the court permits. I think this is the answer I have. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much for shedding light on it, uh, because I've seen so many debates on uh, this yes. in my classes. Uh, okay, so there's one question saying that uh, does do bullies have any kind of psychological disorders? Are they sociopaths, or and if they can be helped by psychotherapies? I think I will take yes, that one. <laughs> yes, sure. So, uh, again, it's not essential that they should uh, have a psychological disorder. See, uh, two psychological disorders which are very commonly associated with uh, bullying or cyberbullying and traditional bullying is about uh, one called the oppositional defiant disorder. So if you've heard about the antisocial disorder, which is like a tendency to hurt, hurt someone or harm someone, uh, the oppositional defined disorder and the conduct disorder, these two are small variants of it, particularly who, which are seen in young children. So uh, these two psychological disorders are very often associated with having uh, tendencies for cyberbullying. But that is not to say that all bullies do have these disorders, neither it is to say that if they have this disorder that they will become cyberbullies. But they can become definitely contributory factors. More often than not, it is uh, important to understand the interactional effect. So things like you know less uh, being less emotional in nature or having a callous nature, as which is seen in antisocial or say a conduct disorder person, contributes towards cyber cyberbullying. But again, this is important to understand that the uh, the peer factors, the family factors, these are also very as equally contributive as a, a mental health disorder or mental health concern. And definitely, yes, psychotherapy can help, particularly if they do have a psychological disorder per se. We do work, so it's. I'm not saying that it's easy, but it's definitely uh, worth working on. Uh, I I do have personal experience working with people with antisocial disorder. So where we try and work in terms of uh, helping them gain empathy empathy skills, we try and help them with prop, social problem solving skills, understanding and identifying emotions. A lot of times you also see people who engage in bullying are not adept in understanding other people's emotions. So some other people's emotions or sometimes even my own emotions. So emotions such as anger might be easily identifiable, but anything such as jealousy or say fear or anxiety might not be easily identifiable. So therapy will usually be uh, you know, directed towards understanding emotions as well as regulating emotions. So psychotherapy can definitely help. What I'll also do is I'm going to put my our email ID and like I said, I have an organization which is called Therapeut, which is directed towards mental health awareness and all of it. So I'm going to put that over here so that in case you feel you want more information about the psychological aspects of it, always feel free to ping me and I'm always enthusiastic about answering questions.
And one thing I want to add that uh, I want to say that everything which has been done or any offenses has been done in a very negative manner or by the perverted mind people. It does not mean that they are psychopath or sociopath. Exactly. Psychopath and sociopath is something really very dangerous. Mm -hmm. They are dangerous in nature. Everyone, it cannot be called a psychopath. And now it has become a fashion to call everyone psycho and psychopath. So mm -hmm. you have to understand the meaning of psychopath and sociopath because my research has been for psychopath. So <laughs> I really feel there is so much disturbed that every other person is labeled as psychopath. True. Although it is really, there are a number of categories of mental illness. Mm -hmm. And you have to identify which type of mental illness a person is having. And out of which type of mental illness, a person is committing a crime. So there is a lot more difference. There is a lot more difference about the categories of mental illness. Similarly, which type of category do which type of crime. So the crime also. So that has to be understood clearly. Absolutely. So here also I want to say that even I have returned my book of psychopathic behavior. Yeah. So please read that so that you can understand the difference between and you can categorize the different uh, mental illness along with the crime committed by them. Good. Often yes. Like Yes. People find it very strange is when I talk about uh, bullying and all of it. I do also emphasize on the traits of bullies and what is done, what is to be done for bullies. People find it very strange. And so, are you advocating for bullies or are you trying to support it? But it's very important to understand that sometimes they are, uh, you know, as affected badly as it is. And a lot of times, aggression is a method that they have seen or they they only know how to do. So they've seen that as a very effective manner, possibly by because of the family that they are coming from or because of the society that they belong to, and they do need help. So it's, it's important for us to balance that too. I think, ma'am, this is the perfect panel for this discussion because all three of you uh, are very strong believers of uh, this. I mean, uh, you, of course, uh, being from psychology background, of course, you ad uh, advocate for it. But uh, Priya, ma'am, and Devruti, ma'am, being from the legal field, also are very active in therapeutic jurisprudence area. So I think uh, three of you strongly agree on this uh, root and the school of thought, which is, I think, the ideal way to approach any problem. Uh, as uh, Atulia Ma'am said, a bully is not born, uh, a bully is made. So it's imperative to understand and get to the roots of the mind of the bully. And I think uh, if we do that, then only we can crack uh, this problem open and study it and do justice to it. Now we have another question from Anamika Ma'am saying that, uh, Will introducing basics of cyber law and cyber crime at school level bring down the cases and statistics of cyber bullying and cyber crimes? So I would like to uh, just modify this a bit because uh, when I was in school, uh, we had options uh, to uh, options to study uh, subjects like legal studies as well as psychology, and we couldn't opt for both. Sadly, I couldn't opt for both. I wanted to study both of them. So I think psychology, introducing uh, the concepts of uh, anti-bullying, understanding the minds of people who are victims of, you know, bullying, uh, introduction to that in uh, the psychology syllabus of school children, as well as introducing basic cyber laws in the syllabus of legal studies. What help uh, can they do to curb this problem uh, from both of you? Um, okay, I will take it first because it's, since you are talking about law, uh, since I've Change the place. I hope I'm audible, right? Yes, okay. ma'am. Uh, the thing is that yes, I in my understanding, if the child is uh, you know taught about the basic laws like what you are uh, mentioning, and also about cyber laws, uh, but it should be in a very child-friendly manner, and uh, the child should not be exposed to something which will make him or her to you know go for finding for some something more like you know adolescent things which will be making him or her exposed to like sexual explicit content, violent content, etc. That should be avoided. It should be uh, like, you know, in a, in a very much like digestible fashion that the child should be told that this is good, this is not good for being a responsible netizen. Now, the next thing is that uh, I would uh, rather like, you know, give an example here. A couple of years back when this uh, ISIS videos were coming up, you know, and uh, they were like, uh, children were also being like, because the children started using the parents' mobile at that time, and uh, several children I have seen, they started like at that time, TikTok was not that famous, but uh, it WhatsApp was. So I remember, and it still goes on. I mean, I have seen in villages, this thing actually happens. The children used to uh, like, you know, uh, uh, 
uh, videograph this uh, cutting of the animals i am a hardcore non vegetarian so please excuse me if you feel offended but you know whenever you go to any shops like you know this kinds of meat shop or, or, or fish shop the children would be given some kinds of like you know devices so that they will be playing with it and they will be taking the uh, pictures of like how the how they slaughtered these things and they will be sending it or sharing it with them now this is something which is which does not come under sexually explicit content it comes under violent content right and it also exposes the child i mean it uh, dr akhilya might uh, you know may agree with me it numbs the feelings of feeling that uh, you know that uh, fear hatred that kind of like you know uh, what should i say i am I'm, i'm not getting it because psychologists will be the best person to tell so once they share all these things they will be feeling that uh, and that's how like you know you have you probably have heard about internet sweepers you know who are hired by the social media companies to clean the like sexual explicit material etc etc so that should also be seen that the children are not exposed to these kinds of things but the children should be told that these are the like you know offensive things which should be avoided i would also like to mention it here i mean uh, i don't know whether it is a right platform or not but it is like you know pertinent to this particular question most of the times when the child uh, finishes the education and uh, you know when they are trying to go for a pocket money or something like that these internet sweepers job actually fetches them like you know lots of money that is something unthinkable for any person from the middle class family so before going for these kinds of works they should also be sensitized it is very very essential now they should be sensitized that what should be kept in their device what should not be kept in their device and why it should not be kept in their device because it is the web uh, you know companies who would be hiring them and it is like you know through a second like third party so in that case it is very very essential that they know about the law they know about the psychology that is cyber psychology that we are just now discussing about and they should also know about the sociology of the uh, entire cyber space uh, so if this is kept in mind definitely i believe that the schools the families the societies can make a proper you know digital netizen yes ma'am so ma'am your insights of adding um, cyber stalking or cyber bullying or awareness about it to the psychology syllabus uh, at school level absolutely i mean i think uh, it would be a very uh, helpful part of it because like uh, dr devathi was saying one information and knowledge is very important so not just to be aware or aware of what we have to protect ourselves but also to understand what are responsible behaviors i think uh, i mean it it should be uh, i mean intuitively when you think about it it should be part of our uh, you know syllabus even otherwise even without it being part of our syllabus it should be something that is communicated uh, in uh, in classroom discussions but unfortunately i don't think that is happening and probably including something of uh, the sort in syllabus per se will make sure that there is easier communication more awareness not just in children but also in terms of teachers who are primarily the first people who can identify these things so when there is the warning signs of people who are being bullied or even people who are bullies uh, are probably going to be first available to for teachers so sensitizing the teachers also will uh, happen if we are able to include this in syllabus and educative materials um mama i think there's a personal question for you also uh, in the chat box i think uh, uh, you can address it personally or uh, i i I'll probably uh, talk to uh, talk to him personally i think that's more appropriate yes i'm sure okay so now there's a follow up question to uh, the school syllabus uh, question saying that uh, it's um so no yes so how about introducing these as compulsory papers and not like choosing a stream such as uh, if i opt for psychology then only i'd learn about this or legal studies so uh, how about uh, a compulsory uh, course on awareness regarding bullying or cyber bullying it should be made because if you see the recent like you know 2020 during this covid time uh, the ncert had taken this uh, like you know measure that uh, certain like cyber related offenses they have been included in a special like guideline which all students must be reading because since from now onwards we are going online i mean and, and i don't know that when we can come back to the old normal that is you know mm-hmm. the going to the school it should be compulsory subject and i think that uh, as you are telling also 
that either it is psychology or it is legal studies unfortunately when i was a student i neither had of op these options you see, you see that was long time back so if a student wants to study either the legal studies or the psychology i think it should be combined because psychology plays a big role in understanding the criminal mindset you know in understanding the victim mindset also and coming to the cyber bullying cyber stalking uh, like you know all sorts of online harassment uh, if the schools consider that this, this should be because they would be probably getting all these things in in, in their uh, like entire syllabus by now if they uh, consider this thing for a uh, compulsory uh, what do you call study material i think it is the students who are going to be the most benefited because uh, since you know the the students who are now suffering for neat or je or whatever it is i think there are lots of group discussions lots of like group bullying etc and since we do speak about sedition laws uh, i am damn sure there are some students who would be like you know directly taken for the sedition laws because obviously everybody are angry you see so if these things are taken into consideration everybody every child would come to know what is like you know uh, proper cyber uh, like you know protective laws data protection laws or speech protection laws and and also intellectual property protection like you know laws and i think that would be beneficial for everybody thank you so much yes ma'am i think that completely makes sense uh, participants if you have any other questions uh, now is the time for you to just drop it in the chat box yes so we have another question saying that is intent also a key defining element when we talk about cyber bullying like in the case of traditional bullying so traditional bullying was first into, i think it was addressed by priya ma'am and then so the person is asking about the role of intention and i think the three of you are um, highly qualified in uh, answering this question so just take turns and uh, i think dr rajesh should should see that as a psychologist you must tell absolutely see uh, the entire concept of bullying in itself is about the intent to harm so uh, any act with so uh, that's why there is the difference between teasing there's a difference between bullying and there is a difference between uh, a comment that is given so any comment which is uh, so for it to be treated as a cyber bullying incident it has to be with the intent of creating any harm in terms of mentally physically or societally or in terms of changing the reputation of the person so intent to harm is a very important uh, definition in terms of understanding cyber bullying i think priya ma'am can also shed some light on it because she is an expert on uh, criminal psychology uh, like she mentioned her phd is also on the interrelation of psychology and law so ma'am words from you please very normal i think every day there are majorly law students and they understand that to establish any sort of criminal liability it is necessary to establish mens rea and mens rea is basically a guilty mind and a guilty intention which is a which is a combination of motive intention and knowledge so if the person is having a mens rea until and unless he is not intent towards any sort of a crime it the any sort of uh, criminal liability cannot be established so definitely for anything even if it is a cyber bullying even if it is a stalking or any sort of offenses it is necessary that there is always an intention of doing so so definitely intention plays a major role and ma'am uh, a question from me what if um, the bullying done uh, online or offline online specifically is not intentional sometimes uh, jokes can be hurtful and uh, they can take a serious turn or a person can be very sensitive so, uh, to some very casual remarks so how does one hold um, the bully accountable in those circumstances where the intent was not to hurt the other person or to bully the other person in uh, in areas of psychology as well as law how do we uh, determine the accountability first of all ignorance of law is no excuse so you have to understand that these are things you cannot be escaped by this saying that i don't know whether this is offense or not even body shaming even bullying even stalking voyeurism anything even if i have seen even uh, uh, you also and many other students they are posting their uh, pictures and videos of their friends in a very 
that might be a uh, example of body shaming also so that is not a good practice and that can be if any person is really hurt and if any person wants to take an action against it it can they can frame a criminal liability so you have to be very attentive whenever you are posting anything or we are whenever you are writing anything for, to any person online so you have to be attentive and this is a key note that ignorance of lawyers no excuse very true ma'am we might also have to think of it in terms of how would you feel if you're at the receiving end of it even if you know you meant to put it as a joke how would you feel at the at the receiving end of it that's one the second is going to be in terms of uh, is it a good practice to engage in say um, so even if it is jokes particularly say about you know body uh, it, it's almost treated as a very normal thing to say hey tu tu muti hai and you know why why do you look like this or you're you're dark and things like that it's very uh, it's sometimes treated as a very normative thing to say uh, and you know and usually it's just it's just fun i and you know brushed off aside i think it's a very good practice for all of us to understand that nobody wants to be talked about how they look nobody wants to talk about their race or nobody wants to talk about uh, what education level they have whether they have glasses or not it should probably not be treated i get what you're saying in terms of uh, you know how do we define the line between bullying and if it is just a joke but uh, if the other person is uh, so bullying is not an isolated incident it isn't it's not just one time i say something and that's completely bullying so if the person is communicating to you that they are uncomfortable or the person is not responding to you then i think it's a good practice to understand to take a step back and uh, you know uh, check your privilege check whether you know you're actually being privileged in terms of talking about these things i have my taken this um, there are certain like you know societies which have taken bullying as their inherent culture you see this is something which is a like you know subject matter of sociology and also law if you see from the like you know customary law perspective uh, say for example if you go for some rural areas uh, or for example in some places like uh, you know some uh, please don't take it otherwise in southern india or even in northern india also especially haryana etc you will get to see that the the, the words etc or the bullying words etc it's taken as a very normal thing and it's a very normal thing again for telling or calling something like you know name calling for women you see so that is the thing that uh, you know this uh, time has come where uh, like you know the society as a whole must understand that uh, there are certain like you know sects of the society the units of the society we are not liking to be called in that fashion you see this is something which uh, we all have to understand and it is from that societal mindset you will get to see that the entire understanding of cyberbullying comes say for example when i talked about atrocities act you see uh, there are different uh, types of understanding where you will get to see that a, that a child or an adult is calling the other child or an adult in a different name and that cannot be a very good name that can be something which is a nickname that is used for some other uh, you know caste name or you know that something which is offensive which we do not know but the, here comes the question that you are not supposed to call those names so i think again i'm telling that it is the socio psychological legal understanding which should be enhanced for making people understand that you have to put a zip here and open your this thing here to understand that what are the words which are offensive so this yes, is so for families you know so even in families uh, there are so many times yes. we end up using these words isn't it so I mean, it might not be with the intent to harm but it is very hurtful for a lot of people and uh, the teaching experiences that i was talking about in my own study a lot of it from most from their own families of origin which is uh, even more hurtful and sort of sets the belief in them that no i am not likable or i am not the way i am is not supposed to be the way i should be so it is very yeah. hurtful that way true 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 yes ma'am definitely i think the last question which we got was uh, that um, thank you for the answer ma'am how do we establish the intention of the bully especially when not when we are not sure of the tone or their facial expressions i think you both have uh, covered this also and uh, this is i think this was a brilliant concluding remark too that uh, it's all here and we just have to control our mouths yes we have to be considerate of uh, the other person's mental state as well as how far uh, we can take the joke with the other person be it friends be it family thing and this is i think the root level but then of course cyberbullying can go to levels which we have seen recently so with this i would like to thank the three of you 
uh, as I said, I could not imagine a better panel as the three of you really believe in the same um, thought that anything can be solved when we crack open the mind of the other person and we try to educate the other person rather than just punish them. So yeah. thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you, Devriti, ma'am. Thank, thank you, Atulia, ma'am, and Priya, ma'am, of course, for taking time out. I think we planned the session for way, way shorter time, but because of the brilliant questions our participants asked, and of course, the two of you addressed them beautifully. Thank you so much, ma'am. And thank you, uh, participants, for being so engaging. Uh, thank you, everyone. Have a really good evening. And we look forward to such webinars and discussions. Sure, thank you. sure. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, both of you. Thank you so much. And it was really very informative and insightful session. Thank you for accepting my invitation and giving us time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much and kudos to uh, the team for, you know, organizing something so, uh, you know, comprehensive as this is, you know, like I said, I couldn't imagine that when you actually approached me, it was really of a, some bit of a shock to understand that you're all interested in also understanding the psychology behind it. So it's absolutely amazing that uh, all of you are ready to open up this way. That's great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.